As you talk about the development of the modern fire service and is the author of fire, Fighting Fires Create the British Fire Service. All to you, Thank you. skilled body 
of the uniform and discipline net of which we can put out fires and put these to deliver in this context. Um, secondly, for Braidwood, it's all about mastering technology and water supplies. You know, instead of throwing water onto a burning building from the outside of the street, you know, he, he pioneered tactics of entering the buildings and attacking it at the, at the root cause, which is really important. Uh, building in the idea of parents and Braidwood into the of ethos. Thirdly, um, it was about centralised command, having these kind of central fire stations, but also branch stations, um, having clear lines of what was the command, um, but also having decentralised operations on the fire ground itself. And you can sort of recognise that from that picture there. You know, the, the end of the fire brigade was divided into four different firefight units, and they're recognisable by the different colours of their helmets. And finally, and crucially, for Braidwood, it was about um, having operational and administrative independence. So that's independence from other financial pressures, like the insurance industry at the time, but also independence from other operational <coughs> groups, such as policing. Um, and that's, that's really important, because in other um, communities at this time, fire brigades were run according to what I, what I call the fire police model. Um, so, from the mid-1830s, under National Legislation, the Municipal Corporations Act, um, towns and cities across the country started to establish police forces. And as part of that movement, they also established fire brigades within those police forces themselves. Now, practice was incredibly mixed and diverse across the country. Some of these, some of these towns, Leeds, for example, Bristol, um, others like them, would, they, they, they hired large numbers of what we call police firemen, who were sworn in as constables, but performed permanent firefighting duties. They didn't do police work. Um, and you can see this photograph of, of the Leeds Police Fire Brigade, as it was called, in, in the 1890s, with the obligatory fire dog um, that all fire brigades had at this time. Glasgow liked their fire dog so much that when he died, they stuffed it and put it on display in their <laughs> fire brigade museum. It's still there, really. Um, but it's interesting because the firemen there um, were all, were all um, officially police constables. So those that are listed on, on the memorial outside St. Paul's, um, if you dig into their history, it's not their fire, they, they, you know, they're, they're ranking you know, so those police constables. Um, other Police fire brigades were different though. Liverpool, for example, or Sunderland or Norwich. There, they, they in effect, um, uh, you know, kind of assigned all police constables as theoretically firefighters, uh, and it meant that the, fire, the police firemen were also liable to do police duty. So there's a you know, huge problem there in terms of um, jurisdiction and responsibility on the fire ground. You know, the police play a important role in managing public order. So there are obvious problems there. Yeah. However, there's certain key themes and principles that we, that, that we can draw out of the experience of the fire brigade. First and crucially, the chief constable was in charge. So even though the chief constable didn't tend to manage fire ground operations, it was left to a chief, a chief superintendent of fire engines, he was, he was responsible to the chief, officer, the, the chief constable. And the chief constable had the final say on things like procurement, um, he had budgetary control, um, so you know you can kind of think about the problems that there were there in terms of resourcing fire brigades. The police budget always came first. Secondly, um, there were these kind of shared costs, shared running costs in terms of staffing um, and pensions, and shared capital costs. Leeds, apart from having one um, separate independent fire, uh, fire station, um, the rest of the fire stations were joint efforts between the police and, and, and the fire brigade. There was even, in one part of the city at one point, a shared police, fire, and libraries um, facility. <laughs> so. And then finally, I think the crucial point to make here is the police fire brigade was really for their economical governance. Um, so from 1856, when the, when the Treasury started funding um, police forces, it meant that they, would, they were also de facto funding the fire brigades if they were police fire brigades. So as long as 
The firefight, you know, firefighting capabilities didn't interfere with routine police duty. That was a home office either, if you like. They were quite happy to fund um, firefighters' pay and and for pensions. So I think that's quite important. Um, but from the 1870s and into the early 1900s, there was growing criticism of the police fire brigade model. I mean, some people thought it was a good example of joined up thinking. You know, much, you know, much like politicians today. Others thought it was outdated and it kind, of, it kind of undermined this move towards a professional independent fire service that the Greyhound School thought was following. Um, and there's various points to make here. The first being that the British model was at odds with the model in other developed Western nations. And the critics, both within the union but also within the service associations, chief fire officer associations, cited three examples of good practice from overseas. The first was the US model. And, you know, American towns and cities were rapidly professionalizing from the 1860s onwards and investing quite significant sums into technology and firehouses. Um, secondly, the German model um, emphasized the importance of technical training um, and the science of fire protection. Um, so that was, you know, which was something that the British system wasn't that interested in at this time. And thirdly, you have the French system, or more, I guess more importantly, the, the, the sapper pompier you know, so the idea of the, the, the fire brigade being part of the military. So these are all models at odds with our kind of uh, you know, parsimonious attitude in Britain. The second point to make is that from the 1860s, 1870s, firefighting was being recognized as a, as a skilled profession. You know, firefighters weren't just fighting fires anymore. From the 1860s in London, for example, they started rescuing lives that became part of their accepted duties. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, they were doing important inspection work, maintaining fire hydrants, stuff like that. They were also getting involved in fire prevention, doing good work in places of public entertainment, cinemas, theatres, things like that, in towns like Birmingham um, and Leicester. So that is at odds with the kind of view that, that, that was prevalent in other parts of the country about it, about it being an additional duty of the police, something that any of any tall people have. Thirdly, the police fire brigades were criticised for the lack of investment. Um, you know, there was a clear link being drawn between those towns protected by police brigades, Norwich and Sunderland were cited here, and levels of fire damage. And this comes across really strongly in public inquiries in the late 19th and 20th centuries. And then finally, um, you know, as we hinted at, the, the union, when it, when, it, when it was formed in 1918, the Finance Trade Union, and the Professional Chief Fire Officers Association, which was formed in 1902, they started to talk together and to collaborate, not, not all together smoothly at first, of course, you know, there's some resistance to unionisation within the service, but they're starting to campaign um, against police integration and they're stressing the idea that if you want you know, an independent professional service that you need separation between the two services. But the statistics, I'm sorry for those guys at the back, I'm not going to read, read these, um, the statistics are quite interesting. Um, I'll just highlight a couple of, a couple of key points to, to draw out from them. But the independent professional brigades those on the Greywood model, so they're rising quite a significant proportion of the brigades rising in the first two decades of the 20th century. Professionalisation is gathering momentum as the union starts to, you know, it, it is created. Police fire brigades, you know, there's a, there's, there's a sort of correlation between the rising proportion of independent brigades and the decline in the police brigades in the first two decades, but then there's a rise again in the interwar period which is basically because of the changing economic context of the 1920s and 1930s. It's a period of the slump, the general strike, the Great Depression, so you know, cuts, austerity measures, fighting work are working hard. So in places like Manchester, they reintegrate the police and the fire services temporarily. Um, but you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an analogy there, I think. I won't stress it too much. So the next part of the story is about the move to police parity in the service. So the view is, the independent brigades and the union take the view that 
okay, if there's going to be these groups, these fire brigades, and they've got access to um, a guaranteed pension from 1893. Um, that's, that's improved in 1919. Um, police pay is improved in 1919. This is all in the aftermath of the, of the first national, the first and only national police strike, right? 1919 that the fire service should enjoy those benefits. There's a dual system within the fire service at this time. Some firefighters are much better remunerated than others. Um, the Home Office, which has been quiet to the point of apathetic up to now, um, takes control of the fire service in 1919 and manages it through its police department that it creates in the same year, which is headed up by this chap, Arthur Lewis Dixon, um, senior, uh, well, an up and coming civil servant in, in, in the early post war but important to our narrative. Dixon manages to convince the Home Secretary at the time to establish a select committee to inquire into firefighters' conditions and service, um, headed up by the Liberal MP William Middlebrook, and they, they published their report in 1920. It's a groundbreaking select committee on two counts. Firstly, because it's the first one to interview rank and file firefighters and representatives from the Finance Trade Union, Jim Bradley, who subsequently went on to be one of the first general secretaries of the FPU. So that's important. You know, firefighters are being consulted with. And secondly, it's important because it recommends police parity. You know, it says from the quote there, the firemen should be treated more or less equally with the police and more generously than other municipal employees. You know, uh, Binman, for example, uh, from the time. <coughs> So it's quite important, and there should be parity in point, of, in point of pay and pensions. The Home Secretary decides not to legislate on the matter, but to leave this up to local authorities, whether they want to um, you know, enact police parity. And of course, the vast majority of them do nothing. Um, so there's, you know, there's, a, there's a tension there. There, are, there is some early progress, though, in the 1920s. So the, the, the Fire Brigade Pensions Act of 1925 um, basically establishes parity in pensions between the police brigades and the independent brigades. Um, it's not a Home Office initiative, not a government-sponsored bill. It's a private members bill brought about through lobbying from the union and from the Association of Chief um, uh, Professional Fire Officers. Um, but it's significant. It shows that there is um, mileage if there is collaboration across the different associations. However, modernisation of the service, and by modernisation I mean the establishment of a professional independent service, not modernisation of some politicians here. Modernisation is really inevitable in the 1930s for two reasons. Firstly, the Home Office recognises the fire service as an independent and professional vocation on the part of the police, which I think is really important. The Home Office is on the side. Um, secondly, a bit more complicated in terms of the current um, context, but there's a global crisis, there's an impending, there's an impending war. I don't know, maybe after next week, or maybe things will become a bit clearer um, with the shift to the right. But there is a recognition within the Home Office that they need to prepare the civil defence services for the Second World War. And they realise that they need to have separate police and fire brigades to do that. That a future war is going to involve aerial bombardment. And there's no point in having police officers doing that job. They're going to be busy enough. Um, so we get another departmental committee in 1935, the Home Office Committee, and it recommends basically the adoption of the, of the professional model. And so two years later, in 1938, the Fire Brigades Act is passed, which for the first time ever makes firefighting the legal obligation of local government. You know, um, it, it, and basically from the parish upwards, they basically inherit the obligation to, to manage the fire service. So there's still over 1,400 fire brigades in 1938, rather a lot. Um, also importantly, it sets the, the kind of move towards establishing national inspection, um, national service of fire cover, because these things happen after the war, the war just, you know, kind of obviously interrupts it. Um, and it starts the process for dismantling all the police fire brigades. Um, to prepare for this, the Home Office separated their police and fire brigade responsibilities in 1936. 
a separate primary care compartment headed up by Dixon that has this job of, of preparing both for peacetime reform but also, I guess, more.